Thank you, Roland. So as a storm surge forecaster, I, I, I'm here today with sort of a heavy heart, like everybody else, uh, particularly for, for the fatalities that occurred and the, and the suffering of people in the city and the homeless that we still have and we may have for many months um, across the region. Uh, as many of you are aware, uh, the storm surge from Sandy was about four and a half feet higher than Irene last year. Um, and it, basically, it was higher than people expected could happen, uh, or a lot of people. And I think the preparation of the city was really uh, ready for happening. Um, so this inundated low-lying neighborhoods around the city. Uh, some of the lowest neighborhoods had about eight feet of water. Uh, but, and many, many neighborhoods had a few feet of water in them. Uh, it likely beat the estimated uh, all-time record for the New York City, and maybe also even New Amsterdam going back to the 1600s, uh, by at least uh, about a foot, um, a foot about two and a half feet if you include sea level rise that happened since then. But um, so it was, and that was in 1821. Uh, so it, it's, it basically smashed the record. Um, of course, in 1821, that storm surge came at a low tide, so things can be worse. Uh, this time we got, got the storm surge right at a high tide, and that's part of why it was such a big, um, such a high water level. So things can be worse. That's a key point I want to make. In 1821, there's a category two or three hurricane. Uh, it was fairly fast moving, uh, but still, we can have several feet more water than we even had with Sandy. Uh, so this leads us to the critical questions that we're going to try to be answering. A lot of scientists are sort of scrambling to answer right now. The first one is, what's the return period? Or more appropriately, what's the likelihood we're going to have this again next year or in the next decade? Um, and what's even worse than that? What's the likelihood of having something worse than what we had in 1821 at a high tide? You know, something like 1821 happening at a high tide. So another maybe four feet on top of what we saw, or six feet on top of what we saw. So something really destructive. So the question for everyone here and for MWA, one, one important question is, what design height do we want to design for with the city? Do we want to design for a 100-year flood, which we really, um, it's arguable that we weren't ready for that even so far. Do we want to design for a 1,000-year flood, a 10,000-year flood? Sometimes people refer, or actually frequently, we hear about Amsterdam or, or the Netherlands and how they're ready for a 10,000-year flood. And I think that's... Um, you know, main point I want to make here is that we have very little in common with the Netherlands, actually. We have a lot of low-lying neighborhoods. Maybe 10% of the city got flooded. But uh, with the Netherlands, 27% of their area is below sea level, average sea level. So when there's a big storm surge flood in the Netherlands, there's nowhere to go. And it's much more severe danger, whereas we have a lot of high ground in, in our area. So we do have the evacuation option. And if we'd had a better system in place for making sure everyone evacuated, we wouldn't have had many fatalities, if, you know, at least from the flooding part of the storm. So, so that's one opinion I want to put out. And, and one thing I, I would question is whether or not we need to, to make massive modifications to the, to the region to prepare for a 10,000-year flood, even though you read about it all the time, how that might be something we could strive for. So what are our protection options? Um, and, and the MWA has put together a good 10-point plan to start um, laying these out. There's four options that I'll discuss briefly. The first three would allow salt water into the, into the harbor and, and into the city in extreme circumstances, um, but they would aim to re improve resilience or reduce the elevations of the floodwaters. Um, the, and, and the first two are immediate ones that we could do very quickly um, and, and are more on the inexpensive side, less debatable side. One of them is to just plug the holes in the city, in the electrical infrastructure, instead of with plywood, something more advanced. Plug, you know, basically come up with methods for stopping water from going into subway systems and highway tunnels. And I think that's something that can be done very quickly. Uh, another approach is uh, for small-scale rebuilding changes, uh, for zoning changes, for making homes more flood resilient as we rebuild. And I think this is probably already getting forgotten. Uh, I'm concerned about that. Um, and there's a lot of quick work being done because people need to get back into homes, and so there's a sort of a, a, a rush to do that. But at least o with zoning changes, we can change how that happens in coming years. Another uh, approach that we've been studying at Stevens Institute where I work is making lar the approach of making large-scale changes in the harbor, like um, you hear all the time about how oysters might save us from a storm surge or wetlands. I think that's overstated, and you need to have kilometers, you know, large areas of oysters or wetlands to reduce a storm surge by 
by uh, import, you know by a, enough to make a difference, like a foot over many kilometers of wetlands. But we're studying that, and we can quantify that, and we can learn more about that. Um, also, another approach that that I've been suggesting is that we could shallow. There's a few um, shipping channels in coastal regions, such as Jamaica Bay, which aren't used heavily by shipping. And so, another idea worth discussing and studying is to shallow Jamaica Bay's entrance channel, maybe spend the money on, on piping sewage effluent out to sea so we don't need the DEP boats coming in and out to deal with that and so that we, we can reduce, and, and by doing that, we, we show with our model that you reduce the total flood elevation in Jamaica Bay. And so, you know, if you build up the wetlands in Jamaica Bay and you shallow the channels, which is just basically a restoration to what it once was, or a partial restoration, um, then that could protect those neighborhoods of South Brooklyn and South Queens, neighborhoods that got flooded really badly, like uh, areas, you know, with beach in the name, like um, Howard Beach, for example, where they had four feet of water in some of those neighborhoods. Um, so that's another approach. And, and uh, the most well-known approach worth discussing, which we're going to hear a lot more about, and you might call the $15 billion question, although I, I would question that the end ticket will actually be $15 billion, is storm surge barriers. Storm surge barriers have really big positives and some potentially very big negatives. Uh, the, the big positive right up front is that it has the most, it's the approach with the most control over flood elevations by stopping a flood completely. Another big positive is that it's been shown to work for Providence and for London and for other cities where you can completely stop the storm surge with just one, one solution. Um, the negative, one negative is um, more subtle and it's that as you reduce surges in the harbor, we show with our ocean model and also Stony Brook showed in their study of, of the Verrazano Narrows barrier, you actually increase the flood elevations offshore by a smaller amount, but um, what, what we see is about 10% increase. And that means with Verrazano Narrows, that means Staten Island gets a higher flood, um, the southern Brooklyn, southern Queens areas get a higher flood, and that probably wouldn't be acceptable politically at least, and morally. No morally. Um, so that's a big negative. And, and just a, a broader perspective is that massive infrastructure uh, projects tend to have massive unforeseen consequences. And one of those uh, is that you gradually build up complacency. You no longer have to adapt. You can move into those low-lying neighborhoods with a lot more people. You can forget about your evacuation plans. And then maybe in decades, maybe in 100 years or two, you still have this same structure that's deteriorating or sea level rises exceeded the design plan for it. And at some point, or in the case of the Thames barrier, maybe a ship crashes into it and dumps and, and blocks it and, and fouls up the system for a month. Um, then you, lay, you get yourself into a situation where you can have a massive um, catastrophe where people aren't ready and you have a much worse situation that you would have if you never built the storm surge barriers. So uh, my concluding points are that the silver lining here is that uh, the flooding could have been worse. You can have an even worse flood than Sandy, and we didn't have that. And so we didn't get surprised by as deadly of a flood as you could have. Um, and now we'll finally have a lot more political will to ta tackle all the smaller solutions and the more you know, sensible solutions we should have been doing for decades now that have been neglected. And also we'll finally really study the storm surge barrier options that we really need to study. We need to find solution for this fl flooding problem. And, and lastly, myself and other scientists in the region at Stevens Institute, Stony Brook, Columbia, um, particularly at Stevens, we're using a storm surge model right now to evaluate these questions. And we look forward to helping answer some of these questions and quantif quantify all these questions about what can protect the city. Thank you. All right, we'll get to, we got a couple of slides. All right, next up is uh, Rob Perani, uh, friend and vice president of the Regional Plan Association, who's been thinking about these issues for also for a while and wrote a very good piece in the newsletter they, they publish. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about more, more about uh, possible solutions and cost and benefit and ups and downs. So we got that? All right, good. You're all set, Rob. We came for Rob. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Roland, and um, you know, hello to everybody out there. Um, uh, as Roland mentioned, I work for Regional Plan Association. Uh, Rob Perani. Um, you know, I, in thinking about what I was going to say this evening, I found this image that uh, Rob Lane produced at a charrette we held with uh, some friends from the Netherlands a couple of years ago, 
And, you know, looking at it, I realized it was kind of a little bit of a Rorschach test in the sense that, you know, is it a, is it a resilient city or is it a flooded city, you know? Um, you know, and it, and it kind of depends on your perspective and that, uh, that question that I think that Roland posed in the beginning that, you know, the, the tragedy uh, of this storm and Irene before it uh, and, and the devastation that continues uh, is uh, perhaps the only uh, positive thing that will come out of this will be that renewed attention. Uh, to the question of flooding and and the fact that this is a city that floods regularly and, and a city that needs to uh, address that issue forthrightly. And um, what I was going to do with my 10 minutes here is kind of lay out a little bit, kind of cover a little bit of the same ground that Phil talked about, uh, talk about a little bit some of the, the what are the, to, the, the tools in the toolbox. Um, and with an eye, you know, and, and I guess this is the, the main point I want to leave you with is that, um, you know, there's no silver bullet here that uh, it's going to be a combination of these tools uh, that are going to be necessary. Uh, but the one tool that we do know that's going to be necessary is the political will to do something. Uh, as there's a number of folks in the room that were uh, leaders of efforts, whether in the city, uh, at, at the Office of Sustainability, uh, in the Office of City Planning, uh, at the New York State and elsewhere, uh, or privately or within the universities, to think about these issues. Um, you know, areas are, are mapped as being flood prone because they are flood prone. <laughs> you know, it's not, shouldn't be a shock when, when storms hit and areas are flooded. You know, unfortunately, uh, it is, um, and, and they're with tragic results. But um, uh, the reality is, is that we knew the storm was coming, um, and we just didn't take action. Um, and so, the, again, the one thing that I think uh, we hope to come out of this, and, and MWA's 10-point plan is a great start, is coming up with an agenda uh, and ensuring that our political leadership follows up on that agenda, both both small and large. So again, let me, I'm just going to race through some of these uh, different tools and again, some of the techniques that folks might consider as they're thinking about the MWA agenda and in the conversations that we'll be having in the months and, and probably years to come. Um, you know, so the first set of tools is really what I would call kind of hard capital improvements, um, you know, uh, investments. Uh, in, in uh, facilities that we're all familiar with, whether it's breakwaters, groins, piers, um, you know, revetment seawalls, storm surge barriers that were mentioned before, you know, things that, that physically prevent flooding from happening uh, at some level or prevent erosion, you know, prevent uh, flood prone areas uh, from falling into the, into the harbor uh, when they're faced with waves and wind, even on a normal day, and in particular in flood situations. Um, the next category of stuff, and, and I, I should say, you know, the, I guess the common theme here is, you know, uh, they cost a lot of money, in particular, as, as was mentioned, you know, storm surge barrier estimates of $15 billion. Um, they also, and again, uh, plenty of folks in this crowd know this better than I do, um, they cost a lot of money to maintain, right? It's not just the initial capital investment, it's the year after year maintenance. Um, and of course, they also uh, can result in, in um, environmental damages. Uh, they also, you know, have other co-benefits, you know, provide access for ships, provide access uh, to the water. Um, but so they come with it, you know, both this sort of price tag, uh, uh, an immediate price tag, an ongoing price tag, uh, but also uh, some, some benefits uh, and liabilities. Um, you know, the next category uh, is kind of soft capital improvements. Uh, and this would be, you know, again, physical structures, but things that, uh, aren't hard, you know, steel and concrete, um, but using in, in some ways uh, forces of nature, whether it's uh, mimicking barrier beaches or restoring the dunes uh, on barrier beaches that protect the shoreline and protect property and, and homes behind it. Um, uh, berms uh, of various sorts uh, or uh, wetland restoration. Oh, I should have, you know, probably could have an oyster reef in here too. Uh, that can help in certain situations uh, to prevent damages from occurring. Um, and then, you know, finally, and this is really the broader category of options that we need to be thinking about, is sort of the world of public policies and, and decisions by individual property owners. Um, you know, as we know, the kind of, you know, the default plan that we're all living with, for the most part, is that each property owner uh, makes their decision based on their sense of what risk they're willing to take. And that's true for a public agency, it's true for a private individual, um, that they make a determination that, you know, that they're going to put that capital investment in or not, 
that they're going to accept the likelihood of flooding and insure it or not. Um, now, some of that's guided by public policy and uh, building codes, zoning, and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, it falls right now to the individual property owner. And one of the, I think, key questions that we as a community need to sort of address over the next coming, you know, over the coming months and years is, you know, can we and when do we move from a system of individual property and individual decisions to a more collective response to this? Um, you know, how does that work financially? How does that work uh, in terms of the political decisions? Uh, how does that work in terms of fairness and other, you know, important questions? So again, um, you know, there's a bevy, and I, I'm not going to go into the sort of laundry list, but there's a bevy of, of, uh, of, of policies that affect decisions in the coastal zone and affect our, our flood prone. Again, just a few to, to highlight. Uh, I should say a lot of this work was done by a Cornell Graduate School studio that we worked with a, a couple of years ago to sort of uh, start assembling and start thinking about these tools. But, you know, we can raise buildings, um, either, you know, mandate it through the building code or work with and work with property owners to make it happen either, uh, you know, presumably this is more on the uh, ongoing new buildings. Um, you know, we can increase the livable area of that building, the freeboard, uh, and ensure that, that uh, people and residences are above the flood zone, importantly, and, and as, you know, we've learned, uh, electric generators and uh, storage of oil perhaps above uh, or safe away from the flood zone. Um, you know, we can also lower density uh, in flood-prone areas, um, both in terms of uh, uh, limiting the number of people there, limiting vulnerable uses uh, within those flood zones. Um, and we can also um, protect, the, we can also use that space, a flood-prone area, as uh, parkland, as open space. Uh, we were talking before uh, w um, about, you know, the fact that many and many of our parks flooded, our waterfront parks flooded, and, you know, which was, you know, terrible for the parks capital budget and for maintenance crews and, and, and for, for those of us that enjoy those parks. But uh, compared to the devastation of our residential neighborhoods and other uses, you know, what a terrifically smart thing to put in flood prone areas. Um, so, um, again, uh, you know, just a snapshot of the tools, some things to think about as you're thinking, as you're looking over the MWA's agenda and as we discuss it. Uh, let me leave you with kind of three closing thoughts. Um, you know, first of all, um, you know, this is a diverse harbor. Um, you know, we tend to focus on the inner harbor sometimes, uh, but as we've learned, you know, there are different conditions, geomorphological conditions, different land use conditions, uh, people, uh, there's uh, um, uh, the communities around the region, waterfront communities have different uh, ability to, uh, have different uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, in terms of their ability to respond uh, to, uh, to a dramatic event, a traumatic event. Um, the second is, you know, addressing this is not going to be easy and is going to uh, involve some uh, painful choices, uh, financial choices in particular. Um, you know, I think as, um, you know, Phil mentioned, I think the storm surge barrier, I think in some ways, whether or not it makes sense, um, it's a really important marker in terms of thinking about, um, you know, measuring the sort of, costs and benefits of a bunch of individual decisions. Um, and so I think it's an important uh, study uh, that the city is conducting right now and, and FEMA and I'm sorry, the Army Corps, I, I uh, understand it's going to be doing in the future. Uh, it's an important study, if only to understand the alternative to these individual decisions. And finally, just to underscore that expensive thing and, and uh, maybe highlight the Harbor Coalition, an effort that uh, we along with MWA is involved with, um, we're going to, you know, this is going to be an expensive proposition at all levels of society. And certainly we'll be looking to Washington uh, to help out New York and New Jersey and Connecticut, uh, as they did in other uh, devastated areas around the country. Uh, but some of that burden is going to also fall on individual property owners uh, and everybody in between. And so thinking about how we allocate those kind of costs is going to be an important part of the decision making process. So thanks very much. Thank you, Rob. Our third speaker, we're very privileged to have him, uh, actually from Sydney, Australia, uh, where he teaches there, but he's also a New Yorker. And, and for our purposes, it really uh, was uh, uh, the uh, director of recovery for New Orleans after Katrina. And so I think as we're in the baby steps of our recovery, it'd be great to hear from Ed Blakely. A big hand for Ed, please. 
Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about uh, the methods or means of doing this. I'm going to speak more from the lessons I learned going through the process of uh, having to do it. And uh, of course, uh, these uh, barriers uh, and other uh, approaches do fail. I'm a witness to that. I've been involved in seven disasters and uh, uh, in California, here, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, elsewhere in Asia, including Japan. Uh, so I want to talk a bit about the processes you're going through. You have an enormous advantage here in New York City in that you already have an active, willing, capable, smart, alert, and able population that is already meeting, thinking, and you've been meeting and thinking about these issues. So none of this comes new to you, and you know how to do it. But uh, let's just I just want to mention a few things. First, it's very important, and I found in New Orleans, different people thought data they had was information. And it's the blind man and elephant thing. If everyone's not looking at the same kinds of data, then it's hard for you to really become informed as to what your alternatives are. So it's very important to think about having some kind of a common database that people can go to and it's easily accessible and transparent. Um, everyone wants to know when they can go home again. And so your recovery is slow as of today. People are not interested in barriers and futures. They're only interested in what's going to happen to them today. In Oakland, we learned that in spades. And one of the things we did was provided people information in strategically located uh, areas as how they could get back home, when it would happen, how it would happen. And because we did that, uh, 97 or 80 percent of the people came back. Um, the one in a hundred syndrome, one in a thousand, one in 10,000, it's one in a hundred chances, it's not years. So when I got to New Orleans, people said there won't be another flood for 100 years. Okay, there have been three since I left. Uh, and the barriers halted them but didn't stop them. And these barriers have to be built larger, bigger, and stronger every year. Uh, moving too fast or moving too slow. Uh, we could start housing people and the various beaches that flood it, and that might be too fast. Uh, because we commit ourselves, as we did in New Orleans, to things that is very difficult to back away from. But if you move too slowly, people take actions on their own, and then you have a big political problem. Uh, equity issues start from the very beginning. It's very important to make sure that we understand all the equity issues, economic equity issues, social equity issues, who's involved in making decisions, how they're involved, when they're involved, and the like. Again, transparency is very important here, and the decision-making process needs to be very clear. Uh, because as soon as you start in one neighborhood, all neighborhoods think, how do they get that advantage? So it has to be laid out very clearly uh, how you're going to do things. And there's some underlying issues that need to be dealt with. Now, we've just been talking about physical issues, but they're economic, social, and other issues. We ought to take the opportunity to deal with some of those issues as we go through this process, or people will think we missed a big opportunity. Uh, repair versus redesign. Uh, temporary repairs never last. And they give you the sense that you've done something when, in fact, you may have made things a lot worse. So it might make sense to look at the current land uses. It might make sense to look at where things are located. It might make sense to figure out whether subway should be above, below, or whatever. But repairing the subway that's going to be flooded again may not be the smart decision. Uh, dueling plans. Uh, we have 10 points here. Somebody else is going to come out with their 10 points. And so every Bible has its 10 points. Make sure that we try to get a common Bible. Uh, that we're not dueling plans, but we can plan together uh, for a better outcome. And as you know, no, that was a big uh, issue. And what's the vision here? Is the vision for a stronger, more viable economy that is resilient, or is the vision just to stay where we are? And local versus regional templates. This is a regional problem. If we don't solve the regional problem, the local problem doesn't matter. 
So we really have to take a long, high view of the entire region and dealing with that. Uh, the BP oil spill uh, is an excellent example of that because that oil spill would not have taken place if we'd been taking care of some of the regional issues uh, because that oil crept right back up the same uh, places where the oil was being produced and the like and where we had not put back all the flora and fauna that was necessary to protect us. Uh, recovery amnesia, that'll start next week. It's probably already started in Los Angeles. People forget very quickly what happened and I think we have to go well beyond memorials and start marking territories, running sessions. The Dutch, the best thing they do is educate people over and over again is this can happen next week, next year, learn to live with this water as part of the school system. Smarter versus repaired systems as kind of the repair business. Make sure we come up with something smarter. It costs the same amount of money to make the smart decision as it does uh, mitigations versus future proofing. We can do a lot of these mitigations. We can put oysters back and so forth, but we really need to look what are we going to look like 50, 75 years from now, uh, and how can we get there? And the economic realities are really important. What is the coming economy, and how do we use these events, as we did during the Depression, to focus on that economy and build a smarter outcome for all the citizens of the region? One of the things we're doing in Australia, and this is somewhat related, but we're building a broadband system, $43 billion for the entire nation, this is going to help us to recover economically and physically. So it's a time for us to think about other smart infrastructure that can be put in at the same time we're simply rebuilding the harbor. Thank you. Okay, well, this is a, we have a, a few minutes to, uh, before we break up into our, 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 our task forces, to ask questions. Um, oh, the, the, the top one is, all right, um, so uh, we, we have these two microphones that uh, can't, so I'll just, uh, just put your hand up. I hope we can get a, more than a few questions in. Um, and I, while, while we're getting, the, I see one back there. Um, uh, I just want to make one one small point. Well, I'll talk about it more in a minute. We the MWA put together. Uh, I was calling it a straw man before I uh, when we were, we started this process to put this meeting together. It's a ten point plan, but it's again it's a starting point for discussion for you all. Um, it's not uh, you know we 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 did, we've reached out to a number of you to help us come up with some good ideas. We think and we you know we, we think it's a solid start. But we're hoping the discussion today will uh, further it along. And as many, you know, I, I saw, I'm, I mentioned earlier, the, the, the speech our Speaker Quinn gave yesterday was a, was a great addition to the dialogue. We want to keep that dialogue going, and we want to infuse you guys into the dialogue, because I think you are, are the experts and the ones that have the most to give as this discussion goes forward. So again, uh, it's not, uh, we're, we're not Moses. We did come up with 10 just like he did, but it's, uh, uh, or God did. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, Please, this, that, this is for debate and for discussion. All right, so let's go. First question toward the back. Uh, back, you see right back there? We've got about 10, 12 minutes to, to uh, go back. Yes, uh, ma'am. This question is for Ed Hurley. Ed, um, Blakely. Uh, yeah, the question is um, what kind of data should be collected right now um, that would aid in, in future planning? So. Would well, it, yeah, all right. would that include some of the, the uh, structures that did um, prove to be resilient within yes, the flood would. zone? Thanks. Uh, the first thing is you have a lot of data already. Your university has it, SUNY, and so forth, and all that data. Needs. A lot of the things that have been done uh, that I've seen so far working with Rob, a lot of studies have already been done. We have a lot of information about the harbor. We have a lot of information about other things. We should also look at information about the Dutch, not just hearsay, but what do their systems look like. We should look at New Orleans, what happened there and what did not, or hearsay 
will capture the day. So it would be very important to have a good, strong collection of data and information. And now that we have the Internet uh, so that it can be equally accessible by everyone and people can be on the same page, uh, it's so easy for people to take a piece of data and create a huge monster that you have to fight. And so I would encourage you to have a database or a data tank or something like that. Okay. Next, we have one in the back. I think this is a question for uh, Mr. Orton. Uh, I'm also from Hoboken, so I had some uh, firsthand experience with what happened. Uh, the big question uh, that I have is uh, how the water came in. And, and I do know that there was a problem with the uh, Long Slip Canal at the south end of Hoboken uh, from, from the eyewitness accounts that I heard. Uh, so uh, were there, are there any satellite images that show how the flooding actually occurred and where, where it was actually entering uh, in, into various areas? I, uh, I, I can't, you know, guarantee you how the water came in exactly. Uh, and I wasn't in Hoboken. I was in Manhattan at 93rd Street, watching the water come up our street, actually, and stop about half a block away from where I lived on First Avenue. Um, but Hoboken was once called Hoboken Island. And so the northern and southern end it used to flood with high tides. And, and it's just been uh, made concrete over the years. And, and the seawalls are higher than a lot of the land behind them. And so once it gets over the seawalls, which are only uh, about eight and a half feet above mean low or you know, typical average daily low tide, uh, not a whole lot of maybe a meter above, you know, something like three feet above or five feet above mean sea level is what that's about, five or six feet above mean sea level. It doesn't take a whole lot. And when they do get over, like they did during Irene and, and now, and also Sandy in particular, I mean, it, it was literally about uh, five or six feet above the seawall at Hoboken Terminal during Sandy. So the water really had far more than it needed to get to the back of Hoboken, get into those low lying neighborhoods. And it came around the north and south end, is my expectation. Yeah, it's a good question. I'd really love to know also. I don't believe there's anything that captured it at, at the time, but the, there may very well be a satellite flyover of infrared or something that somebody can, can look at. And we'll find out in the coming months. But I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, next question. I see no our, our, our ocean model will, tell, will be able to tell us that. We can simulate it. And, we'll be, and there's high water lines you know, all around the city, Hoboken and places that'll give us exceptionally you know, unprecedented data to verify it at every location. And so we will be able to answer that question with time, but it'll be a year, I think, before we can give a definitive answer. Paul? Uh, anyway, a question for everyone. Uh, the, all of this could be predicted by Dan Walsh's thesis from 25 years ago, which basically showed the 45,000 acres of fill over tidal marsh around New York City. And the genius of that fill was that it created immense real estate value. And I guess partly directed towards Ron, but the way natural systems work is they avoid, their resilience is by avoiding catastrophic failure, which we have been very good at avoiding altogether. And uh, 45,000 acres of landscape, if you build on it right, has got to be, there's got to be some way to make it worth more. Certainly the 350 square miles of oyster reef that were in New York City once made the harbor much, much, much more valuable in terms of biotic produ production. I'm just curious if there's a way to look at the kind of economic instruments that can drive production as well as maintain resilience and regrowth potential. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah maybe that's a little bit easier. Uh, that's a really good point. I mean, I think, you know, I think as we consider these different options, uh, it's really important to think about their utility beyond flood prevention. I mean, we know the floods are coming, but at the end of the day, they only come so often. And if we're rebuilding the harbor and rethinking our land use policies in the coastal zone simply around that catastrophic event, um, you know, the, the utility of that, of that area, the utility of that structure um, 
is not going to be maximized. So we do need to be thinking about sort of the co-benefits and what else can be derived out of that. Um, you know, waterfront parks, uh, we know that, uh, you know, Hudson River Park, uh, not only did it prevent some of Manhattan from being flooded because it, it took care of some of the floodwaters uh, on the piers and on the, on the upland area, uh, but it also increases the property value on the other side of that road. Um, so I think that is really important. Um, you know, I think, that, you know, one question that maybe to fill would be in terms of the, the ability of some of these softer solutions in the water um, uh, to mitigate floods uh, and storm surges, you know, how much of that data is there? Um, I think we all, you know, we all saw the rising tides exhibit. There were some great um, sort of uh, images and great ideas expressed there. And as far as I understand, really what needs to now happen is some more testing. Uh, to understand really what is the value of that, because clearly those kinds of solutions that, Paul, you've been working on forever, uh, really could uh, could help here. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The state of the science of how much a wetland can protect a, a coastal zone is pretty pretty far behind where you would hope it would be. Since Katrina, and we've heard about everybody, it's something everybody's heard. So. Um, we're, right now, I'm, I've been working on a proposal to study it that would start in August of next year. So it could be a lot. But we're already playing with our model in simplistic ways and in ways that we would do under this project to evaluate it. But um, and, and it's just a growing area of research, and there's definitely a lot to do. Okay. John, up here up with the Mac Lewis. Or Captain John Doswell. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. One, uh, thank you. One of the things that struck me, uh, because before the hurricane, and, and even last year, we have zones A, B, and C in New York City, and we evacuated zone A because we expected flooding. But I was struck by the large number of businesses and people, and I'm thinking more about the, even the businesses, that didn't move their merchandise out of the stores because they really, apparently, even though it was predicted, uh, and even though it was in zone A, didn't really have the reality of what five or six feet of water, Fulton Street up to six feet uh, at the seaport, and higher for some reason the East River and the North River for whatever reason, but even there, art galleries in Chelsea and stores and bars and Fairmont, Fairway and on and on, it's in the news of businesses wiped out. In many cases, the structures would be there, but merchandise just wasn't moved or no preps. Now we know, right? We, we have a picture of whether it's 11 or 13 or whatever the number is, and I think it was different in different places for whatever reason. That should be a map, and that was one of the things in the 10-point plan that I saw is remapping what does it mean if a 10 or 11 or 12 or whatever the number is predicted. Is that something that I mean, who could be, is that something Stevens would do or someone thinking about doing region-wide is to redraw FEMA the ABC will do map? That. FEMA, will do, FEMA that. will do that. And then, but to really drive it home to the folks what that means, even if the theoretical zone map is one thing, but five feet of water in your store is quite another. And, well, there's, and that connection was not made, I don't okay. think, by uh, FEMA, huge numbers of people. FEMA will require, and there's someone from FEMA they could, help me here, uh, that in rebuilding, you put emergency equipment things above a certain level, depending on what the flood maps show, uh, and put the building in a position where your merchandise and things will be better protected. Uh, if there are any humans in there, for example, most of New Orleans, uh, you cannot live on the first floor. Uh, hospitals cannot have beds on the first floor. In some cases, the second or third floor. These are called sacrifice floors. And so you reorganize the way you do space. And so we might have a situation uh, where you go in the grocery store and you go to the third level uh, to get your food because that's the level that's safe uh, for storing things. So. Uh, these uh, rules, regulations, and as Rob has pointed out, are probably uh, going to have to be put in place, both because to get federal reimbursements you have to have them, but also it just makes good common sense. I want to add two other things uh, that are my pet peeves, uh, and I hope you consider them. 
uh, one, uh, we had one line uh, between us and total failure in New Orleans of electricity. And when I got there, I worked with the state to put uh, electro generators in gas stations, number one. Uh, so, and natural gas is probably the way to go there. And the other thing is I'm really a strong believer of decentralized energy and decentralized water uh, because if you have, as the Japanese do, the cisterns and decentralized uh, power systems, you can uh, evacuate inward and you can save a lot more people's lives uh, because you have a system in your community, not in every neighborhood, but in your community that allow you to be more resilient when these events occur and you cannot uh, prepare for the biggest event. It'd be so costly, it'd be beyond our capacity. I'm going to use the uh, um, privilege. I, 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 uh, we're, well, Bill, if you have a quick one, one, we, one more, and then I'll one, one quick question, and then we'll get what's going to start. Just, this is just a follow-up on the, on the FEMA question. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's my understanding that FEMA maps uh, cover the system of 100-year floodplain definitions and 500-year floodplain. The 100-year floodplain is, a, is the one that requires uh, flood insurance. 500-year does not. The zone A and B and so on in, in New York City is not a FEMA map. That is a New York City uh, map for evacuation purposes. And there's a lot of confusion now uh, amongst the populace as to what zone A means in terms of flood insurance, in terms of um, the readiness of not only the city but the federal government to act. And FEMA doesn't really help to clarify that at the moment. Um, so I'm interested in what you're saying, that FEMA will do this. FEMA at the moment is not, as far as I know, doing anything about mapping um, evacuation zones or flood, flood zones that are brought on by storm surge. They are 100-year floodplains brought on by storms, but storm surge is a, is a, I think it's a relatively new concept and now one that we have demonstrated as a, a far bigger threat to us than simply a storm. I've, I've been on the FEMA technical review panel for their flood zone mapping remapping that they're doing right now. They're basically done and it's coming out and the sad fact is that that was going to show worse flood zones than the prior ones did and there probably would have been a big uproar about it but now I think it might be more accepted um, and it was more and it was definitely going to be more accurate. Um, the, the old flood zones were based on work with computer, it wasn't based on observed flood levels, it may be loosely, but it was based on computer models in 1980 with punch cards and very old fashioned techniques to my knowledge. And, and this was going to be a lot better. And it's a shame, um, you know, it's very bad fortune. And our, and our research also, we were uncovering that it was definitely worse than the flood zones were suggesting. And so um, that'll be coming out in the next year. So that's one thing I wanted to point out. Uh, and FEMA's flood zones, they have two different kinds of flood zones. There's the inland flooding and coastal flooding um, that they map. And so they do, the coastal flooding is for storm surge. And so, and it also has, it shows wave zone. It's, 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 it'll be very useful, especially the newer, the newer maps. Um, it, it shows wave zones where there's additional wave action, which is, is you know, very dangerous, much more dangerous. Um, I don't know what the city's evacuation zones are based on, but I suspect that it's old information that, could use updating, you know, because science is rapidly improving on this topic. And, and also, I suspect that it's based on, hopefully, it was based on flood waters, but also wave zones being even more dangerous than slow moving flood zones. Okay. If I'm, this will become uh, a politically contentious issue. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, even though the information is information, but it becomes politically very difficult because you have people's property involved. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's very important, again, for you to be informed and very well informed on these issues because they can be obscured very quickly. Um, I want to use the, the sneak in one quick more question for you, Ed, uh, and just if you can give a very brief answer, but uh, probably very 
long story. But the Restore Act in, uh, in, in the Gulf, uh, is, this is a fundamentally a political exercise. We're going to try and galvanize support for more uh, political action and dollars. Can you give us just maybe one or two top line uh, keys to success for that effort to uh, get substantial federal dollars into, into the region post uh, Katrina? Uh, we really didn't get much until we acted regionally. Uh, New Orleans could not do this by itself. Uh, the second thing is you have to go after a national issue. Uh, I know you in New Orleans, uh, in New York, felt really sorry for us in New Orleans, but I don't know if you voted for us. Think about it. Some guy in Colorado is thinking about his or her constituency. So when we attacked issues that had national significance, this city does just because of where it is. Uh, then you get more sympathy from the Congress. Then if there, and some of the issues we've just talked about have national significance and national implications. And the last thing is, what is your local effort? How much are you putting in? Because the more you seem to be putting in, the more generous the federal government seems to be. But if you're not putting in anything, you've got a long wait. All right. Well, good. That uh, cautionary and, and, and educational note. Um, I want to thank our, our panelists, uh, Philip, Rob, and Ed. Please give them a big hand. All right. Now, here comes the hard part, folks. You're going to uh, uh, have to behave wonderfully because uh, we're all going to move around a lot. I want to first start by uh, I'm going to thank a couple of folks in advance. Um, there's a bunch of uh, graduate students from um, Bard College, or sustainability program, that are helping us in, in numerous ways that are going to help facilitate. We have facilitators for six breakout groups. Um, uh, Peggy Shepard uh, from WEACT is going to be in the recreation group, which will be in the rear of this room. Um, the education group uh, is Ann Frioli from the Harbor School, and education is uh, over there, back there on the other side of the wall. Uh, then we have Ed Kelly right here. Uh, the working waterfront, and those folks are going to be behind me in this wall gathering right behind there. Um, and then uh, we have Green Harbor. Mike Ludwig, I saw you somewhere back there. Um, uh, working Harbor is going to be uh, right, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Aquitecture. What, I'm sorry, what's uh, Green Harbor, Green Harbor, forgive me. Green Harbor is upstairs in the balcony, uh, right up there. Um, and then Aquitecture uh, is uh, Laura Starr from Star White House. Um, uh, she, uh, you guys will be right here close to me, uh, right where this uh, uh, easel is. And then finally, uh, Water Mass Transit, Rob is doing double duty, will be uh, uh, leading that, facilitating that group, which is over here right by, on this other side of the wall. So again, I remember to remind you, three things we're trying to uh, accomplish. Uh, add to talk about the uh, that that ten point plan. We're gonna make you can make it an eight point plan, a twenty point plan. But let's hear some good ideas that you guys know that you guys have been thinking of that you, you all experienced that we can tell to our elected leaders that to do regarding after Sandy. Then the uh, next platform about the moving forward from the, the wonderful comprehensive waterfront plan that we've all we all put together with uh, you know I see uh, Mike Morello back there with many other folks that worked on that I, I, he'd be the first to tell you he had 200 co-authors on that plan um, we need to tell the next the next uh, administration what are the good things we want to move forward on that one so that 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 agenda and then again those big ideas those five-year ideas to help us the MWA what we should be advocating for over the next so those three things will be coming back the facilitators will give uh, a top line top ideas three but the three good ideas that they caught their imagination and report back to us and then we'll have our marching orders for moving forward and what the things we want to go forward next to so if you can uh, move to a place where you think you want to discuss right now quietly and as you're discussing try and do it politely because we're all in one big room essentially Thank you very, very much, everybody. <laughs>